Welcome to uh, Wonderful Warblers and Other Migratory Birds. Um, my name is Cheryl Meyer. I'm the president of the Chippewa Valley Audubon Club in Mount Pleasant. I am also an adjunct English faculty here at Montcalm. I've been teaching here now for quite a while, probably for 15 years. I'm also on the Nature Trail Committee, and we do a lot of different events, um, different birding events, um, just events on the trails. So keep an eye out now that ho hopefully, fingers crossed, the COVID is residing back a little bit, and we'll be able to get out and do some of our um, cool events. Um, we've done, as part of the Nature Trail, uh, bird walks. Um, I've done warbler walks in the spring. Um, we've done owl walks. Hopefully we'll be able to get back to those in the fall. So if you're interested in birding and getting out on the trails, um, we've got a lot of different events. Today's talk is going to focus in on warblers and other very colorful migratory birds that we see here on campus because there are a lot of <laughs> colorful and fabulous birds that go through Michigan um, in, in the spring. And, Mich and springtime is a great time to, to get out and look at birds because they do put on a show. Oh, warblers. <laughs> um, and just kind of a heads up, little yellow warbler, black-throated blue, they're one of my favorites, and the scarlet tanager. Both, all three of these seen on this campus. <laughs> okay. So mass migration, uh, spring means uh, birds are on the move. One of the really cool things about living in Michigan is, and then also just kind of a thing, I don't usually use PowerPoint in my class because I tend to forget where I am. So if I stand in front of the screen, I'm gonna apologize because I like the point. One of the cool things about living in Michigan, Jennifer, can you see this? Yeah, okay. Is that we get these two separate flyways coming through. Sometimes we'll get migrants coming up the Atlantic coast, and this, um, this piece, they'll wander in. Sometimes we'll get migrants that come, are coming up through the mountain range, and they'll wander in. But Michigan gets this big trough of birds around both, and they come in from the tropics. A lot of the warblers um, spend, their, spend their winter down south, way south, um, the uh, Central America, some go down as far as South America, the Bahamas, um, you know, they're not stupid, they go for as far as <laughs> But a lot of birds will come down from the Arctic as well and winter down here because it gets too cold up there. Michigan, because of the way the Great Lakes are set up, we get these natural flyways through. And so you'll get different species coming up and flying up the lakes. The Straits of Mackinac are a great place for um, bird observation. There is a warbler, or not warbler, a raptor festival in the end of May where they look and they watch the different raptors that come through, sorry, end of April. Too much information going through my head right now. <laughs> they get so many raptors coming up through the Straits of Mackinac that they have a big raptor festival um, end of April and we're talking about bald eagles, golden eagles, um, an assortment of owls, uh, varieties of hawks, um, different uh, carrion birds, crows. And where they, the reason they congregate here is as they're coming up and heading north, there's like a thermal climb of air that goes up through the Straits of Mackinac. And the birds use this to propel themselves across the straits. And so it's one of the only places where you'll actually see all of these different hawks and eagles in these spirals of raptors shooting across and some coming back south. It's so cool. I've never personally seen it, but we've had presenters at our Audubon Club in Mount Pleasant that, that that's what they do. They monitor the birds. They also have um, different bird bandings. So up here, keeping an eye on the different species. It's just a lot of cool opportunities. And it's because of the Great Lakes and the streets right here. A lot of these birds are heading up to Canada, heading up into the UP, some of them stay lower Michigan. So we get a huge eruption in Michigan of different warblers, and as well, other migratory species. We're gonna be focusing on some of the more colorful ones. So get out and you know pay attention to some of the birds that are coming up the coast. Cool. You get a lot of different owl species, um, both sides of the straits, 
Um, it's just really neat. So, uh, ruby throated hummingbirds are one of the first to arrive. We see those coming in late April, early May. Warblers, vireos, thrushes are in full color when they arrive because it's breeding season. So, Michigan has uh, 435 species of birds on its official list. Not all at once, different times of the year, but that's where we're at. So a lot of different birds. The best times to see them is during migration, in the spring and in the fall. Warblers, the best time to see them is the spring because they're the brightest. Once they get past the breeding season, a lot of warblers will, um, will molt and go to um, their, their non-breeding colors. A lot of them in the fall look a, kind of a yellowish, and so it's not quite as, as vibrant. Um, most ha most um, habitat types and species are found in eastern North America can be found in Michigan. So we've got a lot of different varieties. Um, we get birds heading in both directions. Dark-eyed juncos, those little birds you see at your feeder all winter long, um, those guys are common visitors, but they retreat north in late spring. They like it a little bit cooler. Um, snow buntings, those birds you see along in great droves in the winter that kind of look like snow drifts coming in, they come down from the Arctic for the winter. And then as it gets warmer, they head back up north. They breed up in the Arctic. Um, different species like the warblers come from deep south and head north. So. Oops, okay. Um, so MCC's campus, great place to view a variety of species. We've got over four miles of trails on over 100 acres. And the cool thing about this campus is we have a wide range of habitats that a lot of the warblers like. And so when we're taking a look at the map, we'll talk about some of these um, areas specifically. So if you want to go out and take a look for some of them, it um, gives you an idea of what to keep an eye on. Um, we have a range of hardwoods, and wetlands, grasslands, um, different types of shrubs. Some warblers like to nest in low shrubs. Some warblers nest high up in the trees. Birds like orioles nest high up in trees. So you need a wide range of different trees. They're also, the trees are also um, part of their food source. And so Montcalm has, this campus has a lot of native trees that draw in this variety of species. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And if you have any questions as we go, just holler. I have a question yes. already. Well, cause, because I didn't know that the raptors, those types of birds even migrated. They, I thought we just mm -hmm. had them all the time and they picked out their sp space and stayed. Some do. Um, the red-tailed hawk is a year-round yeah. residence. Um, the great horned owl is a year-round. The barred owl is year-round. Um, some of them will migrate you know, north or south depending on where they're, where they're going to be breeding. Um, Salad owls are a little bit more migratory. The um, snowy owl is the big one we see in the winter that is definitely migratory. But um, yeah, bald eagles will kind of range a little bit. Um, golden eagles are very rare for this state. But if they are coming through, because they're typically out west, um, but if they are coming through, they'll be seen through the Straits of Mackinac because again, they get into those flyways and they sort of, it's not that they get caught, they just kind of end up there. There are several species of owls that will migrate north to south. Um, the short-eared owl, the um, long-eared owl. Uh, some of those will stay a little bit more onto the, the coastline. Um, and then there's a whole slew of different hawks that you're gonna see summer versus winter. And again, you'll see them all up in the street. Um, so anyway, <laughs> we've got the migrants coming in. Warblers, um, like I said before, we've got 42 different varieties that come through the state. And they are, they're beautiful. They are just, they put on a show in the spring. Um, they stay, but they, they typically start to show up um, end of April. And their full display, the peak um, observation for warblers, mid-May, there's actually a big bird count in the middle of May, right around Mother's Day, that's um, a national bird count. And um, we, we take a week through the Audubon Club to go to different parks and just kind of observe. And it's part of it's tied with the breeding season to look to see who's coming through. The warblers were late this year because it was so cold. Um, you know, they're dependent on what the weather what leather does too. And that week that we had to count, the weather was terrible. So I didn't see nearly the warblers. A couple of years ago when it was very warm, 
mid-May, I did my very first bird count through some parks I'd never been to, and I was seeing these guys, the black-throated blue warblers, like a pointy thing, <laughs> everywhere. These birds reminded me of something you'd see in like a National Geographic film with from Aus the, some of the birds from Australia, like the bird of paradise, that when they're doing their dance, will get the little neck thing going and they're flapping stuff and colors flashing. That's what the black throated blues do. I sat in a grove and watched these things for like 20 minutes. I forgot I was doing a bird count because they were, they were just everywhere because they're trying to get their mate's attention. And so there's like a little dance off of birds with all, this, all these different colors. And then, so, okay. I'm <laughs> gonna get back on track. I get so distracted, so excited about some of these birds. I'm gonna just kind of start in order and take you through where we see these things. So we've got the yellow warbler kind of going down. We've got the yellow rumped warbler, the yellow warbler, yellow rumped, chestnut sided, American red start. Red start starts another word, an old word for tail. Got a red tail. He's kind of a cool little guy. The common yellow throat looks like a bandit. It's got that black mask, and then the black throated blue. All these guys have seen. I've been. I've seen on this campus, and so we're going to start with. Oh, let's see. Here's my man. Uh, I'm actually going to start with. Sorry. start with the common yellow throat. And a common yellow throat, where I have seen him, this was actually the first time when I was out birding I'd actually seen a common yellow throat was on this campus. And he was, he was so not interested in me that he allowed me to spend some time watching him. I saw the common yellow throat. When you look up, you see South Twin Lake up towards the top of your map. That north twin, south twin. The common yellow throat is kind of right in this marshy area between 107 and 102. It's a very grassy, there's a little there's a little nippet of trail that goes down through here. And I heard these birds, but um, I went down looking for them, and the common yellow throats um, tend to be in marshlands. They like, they like grasslands. They actually nest in some of this marshy little sedge. And that's where they, that's where they predominantly preside. Um, they're insect eaters. And when they, when they are on full display, when they're trying to attract the mate, just like the black throated blue was doing the flashes, the common yellow throat, same thing. They use that, that throat flash. And so he was doing this little little body flip, and they're a very tiny little bird, little body flip, and then little flashes of yellow. And it was down, he was down low, and I kept seeing like this bright flash, flash, flash. And again, he was totally not interested in me. He was more interested in whatever female, and unfortunately the females are mostly not very, just very bland. He was trying to get her attention, and that's where I observed him. So a lot of times when we go out birding, we tend to look up at the treetops, or where are the birds? These, he was down low. I mean, I was seeing him on a piece of willow. So, you know, when you're going out looking for warblers, look all around. I actually was drawn to him by his voice first. I'm not good at recognizing different birds on sound. I'm trying, um, but <laughs> it's really hard. I mean, because they have so many different voices. I was fooled the other day by a robin. So, um, anyway. So look down, but that's but that's but again that's part of their habitat. So this campus perfect for the yellow the yellow throated um, the common yellow throat Martians marshes they let nest low insect eaters. Um, another one that you that I found in this area as well and kind of along this tree line along Tree Swallow Loop. And actually, in some of these other wood, woodland spots, the American Red Start. The American Red Start, my back here, um, they are also insect eaters. 
they open canopies, forest edges. Um, they nest in low sh scrub, sh scrubs, scrub, 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 scrub. They nest in low, that low stuff. This whole patch through here, there's a lot of autumn olive, and there's a lot of low scrubby little bushes. Um, autumn olive is an invasive species. It's a horrible plant, I hate it. But it does provide nesting, nesting grounds for some of these birds. And so for where I've seen American red starts is along through here where you've got this high canopy. And then you'll see them, you'll, you'll hear and see them a little bit higher up in the canopy. And it's, again, that red flash. Um, they also like to have a water source a little bit close. And so we've got, again, we've got the ponds here. Um, where I've seen the red starts in Mount Pleasant, as well as on our properties, again, close to the water, close to the rivers. They're usually up about midway, depending on how they're trying to, where they're trying to track. But you're looking for that flash of red. And so the American red starts, tree swallow loop, is also over into the Forest Ridge Trail. They, uh, and again, they nest low. They eat, um, they eat a lot of bugs. Let's see, who's next on the list? Ah, oh, let's go with the black-throated blue. The black-throated blue, over here, we get into the mixed, more of a mixed forest. We've got a lot of pines, a lot of oaks, a lot of maples, and they like to, they like to nest in the mixed, in the mixed woods. I've seen these guys in here. I've also seen them on other properties in pretty heavy pine. Um, that's, um, that bird count that I was doing, I was so mesmerized by their show. They were actually in more of a, a pine area, but there was, an out, there was a kind of an out, outcropping of maples. So you get that mix. But again, you're gonna look for them midway up and look for, looking, for the, looking for the flashes of blue. They are also insect eaters. Um, they will eat some berries if they can't find anything else. Um, the black-throated warblers, they also breed and nest down low. They like to eat caterpillars. So judging from the amount of tent worms I've seen lately, um, they should be gorging themselves on those things. They eat, they eat different spiders, uh, anything that they can find in the trees, as well as swooping in, they eat different beetles. So, you know, very beneficial, beneficial little bird. So, so we've got, so we've got the yellow throat, we've got the, the red star, we've got the black throat and blue. Also in this area, in the mixed forests, oops, oops the yellow rumped warbler. Issues. The yellow rumped warbler is going to be over, you've got spruce grove loop, kind of come down, this is Brown Road. Yellow rump warblers I've seen in this section along Forest Ridge. I caught a glimpse of them as well along Witch Hazel Trail. With the yellow rumped, they're kind of a nondescript bird. They're very gray, but that yellow butt patch is so pronounced, especially in the, in the, in the spring. Um, I've seen them later in the summer. They seem to kind of fade. The colors seem to fade a little bit. They're not quite as bright, but they do maintain some of that yellow rump. But that's the cool thing about warblers is they use their color patches. And so I've seen yellow rumped warblers in these mixed forests, again, midway up um, with the flash of yellow. They'll come down a little bit more. On my property, um, in Mount Pleasant, I've seen them in some of the maple trees. And again, a little bit lower in the canopy, um, and you're looking for those, those flashes of yellow. Also, insect eaters. Um, and they, uh, they eat caterpillars, they eat, um, uh, they nest, and they like to, um, <coughs> they nest in the conifers, they nest in the pines. So a little bit, little bit different nesting area. Uh, let's see, who's next? The chestnut-sided warbler. These guys, oh, we're back to here. Chestnut-sided are also um, up around 61. So this little concentration here. You've got chestnut-sided, you've got American red start, you've got the, um, the, yellow, the yellow throat. 
The chestnut sided warblers have a pretty pronounced chestnut streak. They're kind of a brown, nondescript bird at times. But again, you'll see those flashes, this, this little flash of yellow. They're not the most colorful of warblers, but they're just kind of a neat, again, neat little bird. Um, they're very frenetic. I don't know, the way they hop around the branches. Um, again, also in also insect eaters. Um, they tend to low nest in low brush as well. We've got a lot of low brush in here. Uh, and let's see, who's last? Oh, last but not least, the yellow warbler. And the yellow warblers, you're going to see over Witch Hazel Trail. I've spotted them over there. Um, I've also seen them, Whitetail Trail, right through here. The yellow, the yellow warblers, like again, like a mix as well. The yellow warblers will maintain that color um, pretty much year round. I've seen yellow warblers in late summer that when I first see the flash, I think, oh, it's goldfinch. But they're a little bit brighter than the American goldfinch, um, don't have that black wing. And some of them will have these little rusty streaks, but some of them will just be kind of a bright flash. Um, I've seen them in our property on um, fruit trees as well. Um, so if you've got orchards, you know, look for yellow warblers around there. Uh, in the spring during the big migrations, I've seen these guys um, uh, feeding around water. And so, you know, maybe if you're out here around this trail, around Wood Duck Trail, over by Spring uh, South Twin Lake, take a look for the yellow warblers, insect eaters as well. But they'll be coming down and you'll see all of these different flashes. Some locations, you'll see all of these birds at the same time. Um, if you ever get up around the Chippewa River in, in Mount Pleasant, um, stomping grounds, there are places where you'll have all of these guys, because they've got water source, coming in to feed on the different insects. It's quite spectacular to see all of these different colors. It's also maddening when you're trying to count them. <laughs> but to see all of these different colors coming in, oh, they're beautiful. And it really gives you an appreciation for the diversity of these of, of the birds. I mean, so often we think about you know just the birds we see in our yards typically, and when you get out and really pay attention to what's out there, holy cow, it's just impressive. So these guys are on our campus, insect eaters. Questions about our warblers? Yes, ma'am. Do these birds then avoid our yards? Because some of them I don't think I've ever seen. And so you have to go <coughs> like somewhere like out here to see them? They don't come to our yard at all? That's one of the things we're going to talk about. Oh. And because, <laughs> <laughs> because that's because that, we create yards that are not hospitable. Unfortunately, they're not hospitable for these birds. Um, they eat insects primarily. And a lot of times, you know, we don't like bugs in our yards, so we do things like spray or plant plants, um, different trees and shrubs and things that are non-native that are insect resistant. And so when these birds come in, there's nothing for them to eat. And so you know, trying trying to create a yard that's more bird friendly, that can be that can, and it can be difficult. So that's one of the things we're going to talk about is how to bring how to bring them back. <coughs> because you do you will see you know in your yard, I'd say. Look for look for the yellow warbler. They're the ones that, that tend to cross most into and where I've seen in different neighborhoods around Mount Pleasant. So keep a look at those. Um, uh, the yellow throw possibly. Um, the red start I have seen in different yards too. And I think a lot of times too we don't necessarily know to look for them. I mean I didn't really notice them in different yards until I actually joined Audubon and started actively birding and then it was like oh wow there's a yellow red star red start um there's a yellow warbler and i just started to paint it you know noticing them so we'll talk about how to bring them bring them into your yard but if you don't get them Oopsie. yeah exactly we'll look for them okay so next wow i get long-winded holy how long is this are we how long are we lasting anyway uh, <laughs> I know I've got an hour, so. Um, but uh, don't wait and watch the show. They lose their color. 
once they're done, once the breeding season is done, most of them get um, turned to a kind of a dullish yellow. Um, fall warbler migration is really tough because they're, they're, it's easy to confuse the different species. That's the nice thing about spring too, is if you're new to birding, getting out and observing these different warblers when they're in their full warbler glory helps you to learn the different birds. Um, if you try in the fall, they'll, they'll drive, you, drive yourself crazy. They're also quieter this time of year. They, you know, it, it, and if you notice, you go out and, and even onto this property, it's a lot of birds singing, but not like a month ago when it was deafening. My husband was complaining, those birds are so loud, and they get up so early. Okay. All right, the next thing we've got on this list, other migrants, um, your buntings, your orioles, and your tanagers. This is a really colorful campus for, um, for birds. So the first ones, indigo buntings. And I'm going to uh, suffer you a bird joke. Any Princess Bride fans? Okay, so whenever I see an indigo bunting, the first thought in my head, hello, my name is Indigo Bunting. You have killed my father, prepare to die. And if you haven't seen in Princess Bride, that makes no sense and I'm sorry. <laughs> no, watch the movie, anyway. But, so. <laughs> All right, so you're in the go buntings. These are a really cool bird. Where I have seen these in pretty regularly. Right up here, you've got this turnaround, um, the drive, the drive. Where is it? Up that way. I have seen the indigo buntings right at the start of this path here, um, heading over, and it's pretty, pretty, pretty shrubby with autumn olive. Um, I've also seen them along this path, like in Lane, and along Tree Swallow Loop, but consistently flying through this open area. There's a whole bunch of dead trees up there, and I've seen them sitting up on the tops of the dead trees. Um, they've got a beautiful song, and they're just such a bright blue, but it's not that bluebird blue, it's that bright, deep indigo. And when the sun hits them, they're glorious. And every year, for the last several years, I've been seeing them up here. In fact, they're, when I don't see any other bird, I you know, usually see the indigo bunting. Um, they are actually in the cardinal family. Uh, they migrate by the stars, which I thought was a cool fact. Um, they migrate at night and they use the stars and scientists have actually tried to, to figure out how they do it to do different determinations of the migration uh, at night versus um, cloudy nights, clear nights. And they think it's more along the lines of the position and the location. And there's some birds that do that. I thought that was fascinating. Um, so traveling by night, navigating by the stars, they, um, they tend to nest in a little bit more open fields. And they're also insect eaters. Uh, when they can't eat insects, they will eat different fruits, berries, things like that. Um, they eat a wide range of things to uh, different spiders and beetles and bugs and they're just anything that flies. Um, and they also head down south into um, Central and South America for the winter. Uh, let's see, the next on the list is your Baltimore Oriole. And how many of you have Baltimore Orioles in your yard, put up feeders? Pretty common, but they're a really cool bird. And, you know, I don't know how many Oriole feeders are up on this campus, but we still have them. Because they eat a lot of insects. And they also, they like to nest, they like to nest up high. Where I've seen them consistently is over here along uh, the meadow loop. This is that paved loop. Um, great little birding spot, actually. Um, the road is loud. So it's hard to bird by ear, but um, I've seen a, get a lot of orioles nesting in these tall trees and then coming down to eat some of the eat some of the insects that you're seeing down here. Um, I've also seen the orioles um, up here. It's just a prime spot anyway, but nesting in some of these taller trees that you're going to see along like the night. And they maintain their color year round. They're the ones that they weave their nests out of a lot of different grassy materials way up high. Um, 
it's a cool thing in the winter or in the, the fall and winter when all the, the leaves leave the trees and you can look up and see those little baskets hanging in the uh, in the trees. I don't know that they reuse them. I think they, but they might reuse some of the material. And the last one on the list is the scarlet tanager. And these guys are tricky. They don't necessarily come to feeders. I've had them, I had them hit an Oriole feeder in my yard once. I was so excited. Sat and took pictures of it and it was the only time they ever showed up in my yard. They tend to be very high up in the trees. Um, they don't come down to feeders very often. The one time that I have seen the Scarlet Tanager on this campus, and so I know he's there, is right along it was actually so i was teaching a class in dozer and it was one of the few times that it was a summer class and the fawns hadn't showed up yet it was the summer we had twin fawns that would come up and basically lick the windows and we got nothing done i was in the middle of, of talking and a scarlet tanager flew by and i was just like oh my god it was a scarlet tanager in my classes what it was a scarlet tanager i was so excited and i have seen them other times but they like they like heavy brush, and so this side, oops, this side of this side of Dozer, and then along. So you've got the um, uh, which Hazel Trail right through here. Really heavy scrub, and the the denser the better, and they tend to be up high. And so I have caught other flashes of red. I've heard from students. Um, who are birders that they have seen and caught, and flat, caught flashes of the scarlet tanager, so they are around. They're one of those more elusive birds that you're going to be out looking, looking for and might never see, but then um, a serendipitous moment of boom, scarlet tanager red, and they are bright. They are so glowing red. They are not cardinal red. They are scarlet tanager red. I've seen them on the trails up in up, uh, running, trail running in Mount Pleasant area. Um, some in some of the backwoods, they like oaks, they like um, maples, and again, coming down to different water sources. It's a really cool, real cool, really cool bird. And another um, buggy. Exactly. So, questions about your brightly colored birds? Um, one that's not on this campus, but I wanted to just touch on. This is the Kirkland's Kirkland's warbler. Um, Michigan's federally endangered warbler. They're not on this campus, but we do have jack pines planted in the hopes that it does draw in the Kirkland warblers. Um, Kirkland warblers uh, population dropped below 200, um, in 200 males in the 70s and 80s. Um, I think maybe it had gotten even lower. They were counting um, songs. Current estimates have it at 3,600 um, birds, so still not a lot. They're very specific to uh, uh, northern Michigan, um, northern lower Michigan, Hartwick Pines area. You can, if you're interested in, in them, uh, the DNR does tours um, to go and see them. They, the thing about the Corkland Warblers, they, uh, they rely on jack pine forests. Because we stopped forest fires, the jack pine forests were getting too old and it was leaving no nesting ground for them. They like to nest in young, scrubby jack pine warblers, in, in jack pines. Jack pines, um, the pine cones need fire to open up and to reproduce, and so no fire, no young forest. Um, they were also uh, kind of pushed out with cowbirds, pressure from cowbirds, and so habitat loss and um, the cowbirds actually caused the decline. Um, the logging industry helps them because there's now a there's now a call for different types of jack pine in different industries, in the furniture industry. So they're doing more logging, and they found that that's actually helping to increase the increase the um, the uh, breeding grounds. So they went to the Bahamas, but although we have don't see them on this campus, we do have some jack pines. Um, my husband and I planted sections of jack pines on our property to try and draw them in. We've never had them, and now I think the jack pines are a little bit too big. But you know, again, things that you can do to for you on your property to try and draw in and help different birds. I think the the Kirkland's warblers have been found in other parts of the state, not just uh, by Hartwick pines, um, different stands of jack pines. But I'm not 100% sure on that one. So anyway.
cool. So what can you do to bring birds? Um, clean water source, like a, keeping your bird bath clean, putting out bird baths, small ponds if you've got a small pond. Um, you know, just it providing water. They like to have, they obviously like water, especially when it's hot. Um, leave areas of your yard or property unmowed. I mean, that's a tricky one because a lot of neighborhood associations require that you mow. But if you can leave, you know, maybe perimeters wild, plant different wildflower seeds, um, talk to your conservation department, and see what sorts of wildflower seeds and different mixes that are specific to your area. Um, we just put 17 and a half acres into a wildflower um, uh, pollinator blend a couple years ago, and um, it's you know it's filling in with different butterflies, and it's also providing a great food source for some of the war for the different warbler species because it's bringing in a lot of different bugs. Also helps with things like pheasants. Um, you can minimize insecticides. You know that's a tough one. Um, I try and go as organic as possible, but. Uh, the tomato, they, the, the different worms that come into my cabbages every year. Mm -hmm. I've harvested one too many hollow cabbages, and so I do a little bit of dusting with a great deal of guilt and horror. And I apologize to the, everything that I'm killing, but I want my cabbages. So it's <laughs> it, it's a balance, um, you know. So you live with mosquitoes. So you live with some of these different bugs. The more the more um, the more warblers you have, the better that will be. And a big things you can do. Oh my goodness. Ooh, okay. Um, plant and cultivate native trees. This is a big one. This is one of the reasons why this campus is such a great one for different observations. We have a lot of oaks and we have a lot of maples. Oaks can support up to 534 species of Lepidoptera. Those are your moths and your butterflies. 534 species. That's a lot of different bugs on one tree. And so that's why you're going to see a lot of these warblers in these different hardwoods because that's where they're going for their food. Um, maples can support up to 285 species of Lepidoptera and again your moths and your butterflies. There are a lot of different species of birds that feed on specific types of bugs and they're drawn to these specific trees. You know we think about the, 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 um, the monarch butterfly and its dependency on the milkweed. They're not the only species that's dependent on one type of plant or you know that that's predominantly helped by that one type of plant a lot of these warblers are so you know look at your yard do you have any oaks and maples maybe plant a small oak it takes a while to grow maybe plant a small maple just you know cultivating some of these more native trees and it's not not just the um the maples um katie did grasshoppers beetles depend on basswoods cherries birches you know, go to your greenhouse and um, go to your local nursery and find out, you know, what sorts of plants and what sorts of trees are going to be specific to my area. Think about what sorts of insects because it, it creates um, more food for them. So much of what we plant creates food deserts in our yards. And I've done this. You know, I like a pretty yard. I love all my beautiful flowers. I want everything to bloom. The problem is a lot of the things that I'm planting initially weren't food for all the things that I wanted to draw in. And so I try and mix my annuals that I get at the local nursery with the native plants that might look a little bit scrubby or I'll let the milkweed come up in my flower beds or you know the um, the goldenrod or you know or I'll specifically or I'll plant some of these different flowers that help that draw these things in. The more bugs you have in your yard, the better it's going to be. And just some native species, again, too many non-natives can create food deserts, aim for diversity. Um, you know, things like the spotted crane's bill, that's that beautiful pur purple flower that blooms fairly early, I think it's just about done. Um, some, of the, some of the different warbler species will eat the seeds um, when, they're, you know, when they're down in the low ground. Um, the New England asters, the purple cone flower, the rattlesnake master, the bee balm, Solomon seal, the, the cup plant, the milkweed, these are things that will bring in different insects that will bring in different um, warblers, warbler species, and not, not just warblers. You'll get a whole you'll get different swallows, you'll get different flycatchers, um, you'll get um, your, you know, even some of your more basic songbirds that you see at your feet are going to come into this. So planting different native species will help. And then just some resources, ooh, I need to change, that's not very bright, I need to change the font on that. 
Um, some resources and apps, the Audubon. Um, Audubon.org has a whole section on native plants. And is this going to take me to the link? Oh, maybe it's doing something. <laughs> the cool thing, it's doing a couple of things. The cool <laughs> thing about this, this one is it allows you to enter in your, um, your email and your zip code, and it will create a list of native plants for you. You can, you can get specific to trees, you can get specific to annuals, perennials, vines, whatever you want to grow. And so this will help you create a yard that's a little bit more specific in diversity. Um, and then uh, the All About Birds, um, Growing Native Plants, Simple Recipe for Helping Warblers. National Audubon Society in general is just a really good um, sort of resource. And then I'm going to leave you with a couple of apps for your phone. And come on, eBird. This is the um, the eBird page, and it's just eBird.org. But if you have a smartphone, they have a fabulous app that allows you to download your record all your bird sightings. Um, I couple that with the Audubon app on my phone, so that when I'm not really sure on a bird. Um, I use the Audubon app to confirm it and then go into the eBird and record it. It keeps track of all your birds, lets you see what other birders in your area are doing. So if you would... Cheryl, you, how do you confirm that? Are you, are you taking a picture and downloading it into theirs to confirm or the sound, like a sound file? They have all of that, yes. So, okay. on, the, so on the eBird app, if, you know, especially if there's a question like with the, um, the black crowned night heron, I snuck up on it and got tried to get some decent pictures, and then um, I downloaded the file through my phone. It seems to be the easiest because my internet is terrible. So, and but they also have audio files. There have been times when I've done a done a full recording with um, with a video and sent that, and so they use all of that. If it's just you know a basic bird count and a common bird, you don't need to do all that. But if it's something that they and they when you open up the list on eBird, when you've got the app, it tells you what birds to expect, and then it also tells you which ones are rare. And so you know if you see something that's maybe a rare number or a rare bird for your area, you're probably going to get an alert, which is kind of cool. But you can, you know, but you can record it, and it also helps you to learn about the birds. Because if you if they are not sure about a recording, they will say, is it this or could it be this? And then they give you different options to look for. And you can say, oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe it was this bird. Which can also get confusing. I went around with a snow goose and a, or a different, or two different types of possible snow geese and went around and around with a bird about snow geese. And, ah, anyway, they're a cool sight. And then the other one, iNaturalist. This is another app. Come on, open up. It's not gonna go. There we go. See, I have to tell it go. This is another app for your phone. Um, iNaturalist is a, this one allows you to record your observations, and it's not just birds, it's also insects, plants, um, anything in the outdoors. Um, this is a cool app for it's um, contributing to helps you to contribute to science as a citizen scientist and talk about your different findings. Um, it helps you keep track and it helps you to learn. And it's just again another helpful app for learning about the different types of bugs and you know learning about what's out there. Another full hour, so. All right.